Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome back. Um, there we go. Some technical, uh, some technical things. Um, I keep wondering uh, if I can catch myself looking good in a moment on this thing, but that's impossible. Um, so if anyone else is trying, um, you probably look amazing. And um, I have to take back some of that knowing that I see you looking amazing. So I probably do too. Um, our first big technical glitch of the night. Luckily, uh, we were able to hear the incredible and powerful and empowering words of Cyrus Marcus Ware. Um, and uh, I'm gonna pass it now back to uh, Chantal to introduce um, uh, the next part of our evening. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and again, thank you everybody for your patience with the technology. Um, if we were in a room live and actors were performing on stage, this would be the moment where an actor goes um, up on his line and um, you watch them try to recover. So I hope we recovered um, nicely. So to follow up on Cyrus's powerful words, um, we'd like to offer you a sound piece by American multimedia artist, artist and architectural designer, Jose Rivera. This piece was commissioned specifically for the green rooms and is titled, Dear George, You Help Me Be Like Water. It's 10 minutes long and Jose asked us to tell you this before um, we play this piece. Dear George, You Help Me Be Like Water is a meditation on cycles and transformation and imagines creating a space of curiosity and compassion. The piece includes field recordings, guitar, and other found sounds. Feel free to close your eyes, get up, walk around, or write down images, thoughts, or feeling that come to mind. And if you'd like to, you can share them in the chat. So here's Jose's piece.
And we're back. And um, thank you, Jose, for this beautiful music. I have uh, listened to it a few times now. And every time it, it really moves me, but it's also, it really, it really calls me down. So um, it's a wonderful gift. And now uh, it is my great, great pleasure to introduce, to, to introduce you to our keynote speaker for the Green Rooms, um, an extremely dynamic and inspiring woman named Ariel Sehekwe Derange. Ariel is executive di director and co-founder of Indigenous Climate Action, which is the only Indigenous climate justice organization in Canada. She's also an active member of the UN Indigenous Peoples Forum on Climate Change and a founding member of the Global UN Indigenous Youth Caucus. And perhaps my favorite credits of hers is that she has worked on the International Indigenous Tar Sands Campaign, challenging the expansion of Alberta's tar sand. Uh, welcome, Ariel. Thank you so much for having me here today. So I'm, I have slides, and so we're going to do this whole technology thing while I get started here. There we go. So I... First off, thank you so much for having me. I'd love to acknowledge the opening um, with Georgina. So thank you so much. So Iklanete Dene Sotaneta Ariel Tseekwe Huche Durange Bitsi and Hesli. My name is Ariel Tseekwe Durange, and in my language, my name in Dene Sotlane, my name means Thunder Woman. I'm a member of the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation or the Kaitale Dene Sotane peoples, which in Dene means people of the willow. And this gives life and recognition to the lands that we have occupied for time immemorial. Dene, the who we are as people, the word actually means to flow from the land. And we are intrinsically linked and connected to the natural world. We are one and the same. I am the willow and the willow is me. The land is more than just a place for indigenous folks. It is, it is where I was nurtured and nourished as a child. It spoke to me through the wind, the babbling brooks, rivers, streams, the forests, the medicines we picked, the animals we tracked, hunted, trapped, fished and harvested, and through the stories of our ancestors. Many of these stories were delivered via the land, the air, the earth and all of our relatives. We are all related as a phrase that's often spoken by our people and it's not limited just to our human relatives but includes the winged ones, the four-legged, the ones that swim and each living organism on mother earth to the air we breathe, the rocks, mountains, the moon and the stars. And this is passed down through indigenous knowledge. And indigenous knowledge systems are the drivers of our community and they're passed down through experiential learning and storytelling. And it helps to bind us to the collective knowledge and experiences of all of our relations. This collective identity is built into the values and beliefs of our community. And it has become so divergent from the ideological values of the current colonial, patriarchal, hyper-individual, capitalist capitalistic systems that we currently live under. This is from the De Cho First Nations and this is the Dene Principles that really talks about the collective nature in which, which we live. This collective identity um, is not unique to our my own community, but is representative of the millions of indigenous peoples that call this planet home. There are approximately 370 million indigenous peoples worldwide, representing approximately 5% of the global population. We belong to over 5,000 distinct groups in 90 different countries. And this represents every region of the world. What gets really interesting is that indigenous peoples use and occupy somewhere between 22 to 60%, 64% of the land surface for our subsistence and cultural lifestyles. This is versus 3% of the land is utilized for urban centers where most of humanity lives. What becomes really interesting is that 80% of the world's global biodiversity is within the traditional territories of indigenous peoples and 85% of the world's protected and conservation areas is within or adjacent to indigenous lands and territories. This is not a coincidence. It comes from the very nature of who we are. As I said, Dene means to flow from the land. We are the land. 
And Indigenous peoples are not just protecting the biodiversity of the planet, but these areas overlap with hundreds of gigatons of carbon sinks that are critical to keeping intact for climate stabilization. The unique values of of our communities determine everything from how we manage our lands and resources to how we govern our communities, educate our youth and take care of our elders. While indigenous peoples have the same rights as everyone as outlined in the UN Declaration of Human Rights, the UN Declaration of Human Rights was created before indigenous peoples even had personhood across most of the planet. And it upholds the unique individual rights and does not acknowledge collective rights. The UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples um, recognizes and infer, affirms collective rights. And it also addresses the ongoing legacy and impacts of colonization and the unique positions that First Peoples have in society. It took almost over 20 years of lobbying and negotiations at the UN level to come to this agreement. And it wasn't adopted until 2007. It does provide the framework uh, for minimum standards to ensure that our cultures, languages, laws, customs, and rights are protected and included in decision-making process as they become one of the most critical documents for Indigenous peoples. However, the history of so-called Canada and the United States alike is rooted in a history of settler colonialism, rooted in white supremacy, African slavery, and policies supported by the church and state of genocide and land theft. These systems attempted to demonize, devalue, and extinguish Indigenous peoples' languages, political and cultural structures, ideological perspectives, and way of life. The European colonists came to this land with a drive of conquest to reap the benefits of this land, and they did this with violence and a goal to consume this world. Tens of millions of people and animal life were extinguished for personal wealth and power, justified wholly in the name of progress and um, domination. So here we are in this world and they, they didn't just do this, like physical life wasn't just lost, but these plunderings came with these ideas that demonized and devalued the ideological perspectives of indigenous peoples that we are in fact interdependent with the natural world. They tried to sever that, that this planet is in fact our mother. It also gave way to the subjugation of women and moreover the loss of culture and identity, ceremony and the place of women in indigenous societies and replaced these systems with ones rooted in patriarchy, capitalism, hyper individuality and essentially a system of cannibalism to consume everything. A place where progress looks like taking all that you can and gaining as much power as you can. All of this with the end goal of erasing indigenous peoples from the land erasing the language of the trees, the water, the air. But we've all been led to believe, that's a different story here. We've all been led to believe that treaties were, were created to share the land. The treaty making process is unique to Canada because the British Crown agreed that they would not take up any land without treaty, setting this country apart from their neighboring United States where violent wars were waged. However, large tracts of this country remain untreated, putting into question colonial sy systems that society at large has bought into. All the areas in yellow in this map are untreated or unceded territories and should be under the jur jurisdiction of original peoples. I also want to note, just because treaties were signed does not mean that we ceded or released the lands to our uh, colonial um, partners. I come from Treaty 8 territory, uh, which is located in northern Alberta. This treaty territory covers roughly 841,000 square kilometers of land and encompasses parts of northern Alberta, northwest Saskatchewan, northwest territories, and BC, making it the largest treaty history in the country. In the country. Yet my people remain the last to be consulted on what happens in our lands and territories and our communities continue to battle against poverty, unemployment and systemic racism. Almost all aspects of treaty agreements have been broken over and over again by colon the colonizers of this land. However, this image provides a stark contrast to the intent of treaty and the reality. 
Through our treaty, throughout, throughout time, our treaties have been degraded to simply the lands recognized as reserves, which actually only account for 0.2% of the lands in this country. The other 99.8% is considered crown land and is under the control of settler colonial society, leaving many of our communities disempowered and disconnected from our places of origin. And what has happened when the lands and waterways, our relatives, our places of origin, have been put into the hands and control of people who came here simply to achieve individual power and wealth and erase those connected to the land. It's things like this, the Alberta tar sands, the largest industrial project on earth happening upstream from my own community. This colonial ideology has become so pervasive and has permeated dominant culture so that anyone that challenges this form of progress is simply just anti-development. Despite the warnings from Indigenous peoples that these types of projects, and I just want to say tar sands is just a microcosm of many mega projects happening across the world that are destroying the land. And yet we continue to raise the alarm and these projects continue to grow and grow and grow, modeling capitalist systems of infinite growth on a finite planet. This isn't just about, and these projects have no regard for my people, our rights, and moreover, our relatives. These are the victims of this abuse of our lands and territory. And this isn't just simply about, about our people not being able to hunt fish and trap where it's been degraded. You know, I'm no stranger to those that retort to our challenges of these projects with, why don't you just go buy your groceries in the store like the rest of us? This destruction to our lands and territories affects all aspects of our mental, emotional, and spiritual well being. It doesn't just affect the land, it affects everything about who we are. Dene Slotlene. I am the willow, the willow is me. So centuries of abuse to the land has culminated to the current climate crisis. Global CO2 emissions rise every year, sprung forward by the blind acceptance of the status quo that this is just the way things are. So humanity is walking toward the edge of extinction. Those of us that see the plunging cliff sides are pleading with those people to stop this mindless march. Sadly, even those of us that are trying to stop this exodus become complicit in taking steps in the same direction to our own end. And we just keep on building, keep on destroying systems that fed us, nourished us, and keep us alive. The anthropogenic footprint just keeps marching forward and we are told there is no other way. Forest fires, floods, drought, rising coastal lines, famine, loss of life plague the planet. And those most deeply impacted by those changes are those most deeply connected to the lands, not just for food and shelter, but those connected by relationship and by languages that were lost and stolen from our communities by a colonial systems of white supremacy, capitalism and greed. Climate change poses threats and dangers to the survival of indigenous communities worldwide, even though we contribute the least to greenhouse gas emissions. Indigenous peoples are vital to our ecosystems and our lands and territories, and we actually enhance the resiliency of these ecosystems. There have been countless reports to support this. And in addition, we actually interpret, react, and come up with ideas and draw on our Indigenous knowledge and modern technology to come up with solutions to combat climate change that society at large could replicate if we would just listen. The earth is out of balance. We are out of balance with ourselves and with our mother. In order to address the climate crisis, we must restore our relationship with mother earth and with each other and address this imbalance in all aspects of our life. So you would think things couldn't get much worse. We're in this massive climate crisis, you know, racism exists, but here we are. 2020 battling, you know, systems of colonialism that bred climate change and bam, global health pandemic emerges and shakes the planet to the core. There are days that I'm completely at a loss as to how this tiny little virus could be louder than any campaign I've ever been a part of and really demonstrating the power of Mother Earth. Some scientists and biologists are suggesting that the current climate crisis and unstable models of capitalism and globalization have lent to the worsening and precipitating the current global pandemic. 
a theory that I'm actually now partial to believing is very accurate. One thing has become clear. We are very, very poor as a species at taking action before a crisis emerges. And even, even then we struggle to believe that it's real. Just like the climate crisis, there have been warnings for years about an impending panic, yet nothing was done. Many people stated that this pandem pandemic has brought humanity closer together and countries are working together and this is so great. Making comments like we're all in the same boat, it's, sh it's really highlighting this. The reality is, is we're all just in the same storm. Not all of us even have a boat to weather this storm. As indigenous peoples, the impacts have been much worse. We are witnessing in real time in the Navajo Nation, my Diné relatives, literally I'm related to them, they're the Diné of the South or the Diné of the North, are experiencing some of the highest rates of COVID on the continent. But long before COVID, our people had been experiencing poor access to healthcare, higher rates of disease and infection, lack of access to essential services, sanitation, adequate housing, clean water. In addition, we have faced a history of stigma, discrimination and trauma. We're interacting with settler services um, and lending to the degradation of our mental, spiritual, emotional well-being. Despite this, our people are leaning into the whispers of our ancestors and still continuing to return to our teachings. It's been so empowering and beautiful to witness this moment in which I've seen our indigenous partners respond and not just talking about this pandemic, but this moment of the culmination of over 500 years of oppression, disease, famine, loss of life, state violence, global climate crisis and a health crisis, crisis all together. Instead of falling down, we are seeing our communities have indigenous language classes and learners increase. Traditional medicine and food harvesting has become more reliable than grocery stores for some rural communities. And our people have asserted our own systems of governance to determine how our community responds to this crisis. And many of our leaders are encouraging our people to return to the land as protection and healing from this pandemic. All of this demonstrates the strength of indigenous systems and our resiliency in time of crisis. After all, I speak these words as a testament to the resiliency and strength of my ancestors. Despite centuries of attempted genocide, I am alive and I'm able to introduce myself in my language and I can still hear those whispers of my ancestors in the wind. This pandemic has also highlighted the ability for society at large and the colonial government to quickly act and make drastic changes to the status quo of life as we know it. In months, countries have walked down millions of people, air travel has been crippled, conferences and meetings moved online, and life as we know it has drastically and fundamentally changed. The economic systems we have relied on are falling apart and many people are actually looking to their communities and their neighbors to fill the gaps that capitalism has left. The impacts it has had on the global emissions is stark and noticeable. Imagine what would happen if we reacted to climate change and the systems that brought about climate change, like colonization, white supremacy, patriarchy, capitalism, consumerism. Imagine if we reacted in the same way that we reacted to this virus. I have seen communities of care emerge, met more neighbors and community members. I've seen our people stand proud in our culture and rights. I've witnessed the shift in consciousness as a species. Moreover, I've been witnessing more people listening. And I'm not just talking to TV and social media, but listening to each other. And some are even starting to hear the voices of the land calling us back to our origins and questioning the reality that we have bought into. It's time for us to take a hard look at the root causes of the global crises we are witnessing. During the last two years, my organization, Indigenous Climate Action, has been talking with communities about the climate crisis, and time and time again, we hear these words, colonialism, patriarchy, capitalism, white supremacy, extractivism. And for many of our communities, when we say climate change, they say it started when the white man appeared on our shores and changed everything about our world. Climate change happened when we were forced off of our lands when our children were stolen, when our languages were forbidden, when our ceremonies were outlawed and when we were told to stop listening to Mother Earth and start listening to the ways of greed. We must acknowledge that colonization isn't something that's happened. It continues to happen right now and shape the world. Systemic racism is real and true change happens when we address these problems. And my organization, 
is invested in dismantling this and empowering our communities to work towards true decolonization. And decolonization in its simplest form is the return of and connections to land. If we decolonized our minds, our environments, and our ways of being in the world, the opportunities become boundless. I'm not saying we go back to living like we did 500 years ago. I'm saying we uplift and acknowledge and recognize that pre-colonial systems were valid and allowed for flourishing economic, educational, and governance systems to exist for thousands of years. Our current structures are only hundreds of years old and they have damaged the planet in ways our people could never imagine. Indigenous peoples, our cultures, our values, our languages, our knowledge connect us to the sacredness of Mother Earth. Our voices and solutions are critical to developing climate solutions, mitigation and adapt adaptation strategies that will benefit everyone. I would also be remiss if I didn't acknowledge what's been happening over the last uh, few weeks. And thank you so much, Cyrus, for your really, really great uh, explanation of what's going on. But as we witness the global uprising of black people and the Black Lives Matter and black liberation movements responding to the continued state murder of black people, we have to remember the foundations of this continent are built off of the stolen land of indigenous peoples and the stolen lives and labor of our black relatives. And instead, of appreciating us, we have been brutalized, criminalized, and murdered simply for exist existing. The liberation of our black and brown relatives revolutionizes our collective efforts for sovereignty and self-determination. Our efforts to end centuries of white supremacy and colonization require us to work together. And in this moment, we must support the lead and direction of our black relatives. As BIPOC people, we are coming together to challenge these systems advocating for black, black lives, advocating for the planet, advocating for life. We are not protesters out in the streets. We are protectors, protectors of life. There's a, you know, I have seen our people come out over and over again and be criminalized simply for trying to speak the words of our ancestors. I have seen that in any great undertaking, it is not enough for a man to depend simply on himself. We must come together and unite and listen to the voices of our relatives that have been muted for so long. The earth is calling us, are we listening? I wanna end with a prophecy that I learned from an Inuit elder in Alaska. Before the last ice age, the people of Turtle Island saw the changes on the land. They began to feel the changes and recognize that something of a true significance was happening. And it was told that an elder called for a great council to come together and all the people would be invited to come together and they'd have to drop their wars and disputes. And at this council, they would be sharing their stories, their techniques for survival from harvesting and food preparation, from shelter and ceremonies. And they would do this because they recognized that despite their differences, they were a part of the same collective and their survival was contingent on the survival of their neighboring communities and survive we did. It was also said at this great council that it was prophesized that another great change of the land would come once again in the future, except it would be much worse and more drastic. And that at that time, once again, the people of the world would have to come together to share their stories, their strategies, their techniques for survival. We would have to abandon our wars and disputes and come together for the survival of the collective. And remember, the collective isn't just humanity. It's all of the animals. It's all of the life on this planet. Some say that we are in that time now and we need to come together and we need to act now. Another world is possible. The question is, will you take the steps to make it happen? Messi Cho. If I can. Thank you. Thank you, Ariel. This was wonderful, um, very inspiring. And I'm so sorry we are not um, together with people and we can't reach out to each other, shake hands, you know, say like, I'm so happy you're here. Um, but I want to take a few moments now. Um, we're going to do a Q&A with people who are in the Zoom rooms, but we're going to do something a little different, um, given our 
technological setup. So I'm going to ask all of the participants who are in your rooms to please um, grab a piece of paper, a pen and a piece of paper and write your question on a piece of paper that you can then hold to the camera. And um, Ariel and I are going to take a look at these questions. Um, you'll have two minutes. We're going to have, um, this is a symphony of questions and we have a little bit of music to go with it. So we'll, we will watch and listen to this symphony for two minutes. And then um, we'll pick a few of the questions that um, Aaron can answer afterwards. We'll have about two, three questions that we can answer. So please get ready. Um, your facilitators in each of your room can help you if you need any help. And um, let's see uh, what you would like to ask. It is live on both of us now. I guess it's our turn to answer the questions. So many questions. <laughs> so here are a few questions that I had time to jot down, but um, please feel free to, uh, if you have some that you saw that uh, grab you, feel free to answer them too. Um, the ones that I have are, will, when will sustainability and wellness be valued over GDP? Uh, how do we amplify positive changes and how do we remember that the impossible is possible? Mm. <laughs> Some light questions. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Oh, here's <laughs> another one. How do we um, feel most connected? Uh, when do, do you feel most connected to the earth? This is one directly for you. I mean, I think that that one's probably the easiest. Uh, for me, it's when I'm out on the land doing something, anything, sometimes, the best thing for me if I'm having a hard day is just to literally go for a walk. Um, going into my community also makes me feel the most connected. Yeah, uh, as far as when will we shift GDP to include wellness and sustainability, there have been people working on that for over a decade. Um, it's it's hard, you know, there's actually whole schools on that. Um, uh, you know, there's a really great group called Kansi. I don't remember what it, exactly it's like ecological economics, but looking at how we can include like, not just uh, like ecological, like thinking of the earth is separate, but the interconnections between humanity. Um, I don't know when we'll see that. I really do feel that COVID has really put a lot of questions into how our current systems are structured. And I'm hoping that we'll continue to see that critique um, as we like 
uncover ways of like getting back to normal as a lot of people are trying to frame it that we actually really really evaluate what that means like what does getting back to normal and that we uphold systems of wellness because I know for my organization like healthy employees and healthy staff and healthy communities is what we're trying to strive for and without that like we are going to continue to struggle to be out of balance um the other question was oh god I've already forgotten sustainability wellness uh how do we amplify positive changes positive changes yes so uh there's all sorts of really really amazing work being done on amplifying solutions you know there's uh there's a really great show by one of my colleagues called uh, Melina Labucon Massimo called Power to the People. It's on APTN and it talks about all these amazing solutions coming from Indigenous communities across Canada. Um, I think like, you know, we live in a social media world. It's just really amplifying that it's not just all doom and gloom. Like, I think a lot of our communities, despite like living with like inadequate resources, funding, housing, all of this stuff. Um, we've seen some really, really amazing projects come out of Indigenous communities. Like, and that's like, this isn't just limited to Canada. Like, we've seen the resiliency of communities show up in Australia, in Africa, uh, in, in Asia, in, you know, Latin America, where there's so many beautiful projects that are drawing on traditional knowledge and our understanding of the land and technologies and bringing about these incredible solutions that uh, folks wouldn't have otherwise thought about. I, I think like looking for them and sharing them and but also recognizing that it's not just about sharing the stories because like the reality that you have to dig and find them is a testament to the systems that we still live under. The institutional racism to continue to try to erase our stories still exists. I think more than amplifying stories, it's amplifying the story that we live under these systems of, um, you know, racism, white supremacy, capitalism, like we need to be sharing those and then countering them with those stories of positivity. Because if we only share the positive, we can forget about the things that are actually making it so hard to hear those stories. Mm. And I had, there was also a very specific question um, from somebody who teaches kids and is asking, what is the one thing I could teach kids? <laughs> I think, to be honest, a fundamental thing that I didn't realize how important it was for me until I was an adult and recognized that I was privileged to have this was that all my relations, the understanding the relationship with the natural world and that we are not just related in some like sort of wooey meta, like, like, ooh, indigenous people believe that we're related to everything. We are literally fundamentally from like a scientific perspective related to all life on planet Earth. And like we often forget those connections. But when we when you grow up with this understanding and respect that like every blade of grass and every bird in the tree and every animal is re your relative, you have a different relationship with the natural world. It's something that is more you have like this innate feeling and responsibility to your family. I often talk about like so I think for me, like teachers and of, of young learners teach them that they are a part of the natural world, teach them that they are related to everything on this planet. I really think it'll fundamentally change them. For me, when I had it, I'd been sort of disconnected from my land for many years because um, my parents divorced. I didn't go up to my territory for a while. And then when I went back there, it was like decimated by tar sands. But because of those foundations of understanding who I was and my relationship to the natural world, when I saw the destruction, it wasn't just like, oh my God, this is terrible. It was like one of the hardest moments for me because it was literally like seeing a family member like dead on the side of the road. I remember the moment like feeling like my chest was like someone was sitting on my chest and like tears came out of my eyes and I couldn't breathe. My ears were ringing because I, all I could see was all these places that I knew were my relatives, my ancestors just destroyed like it was nothing. And imagine if we all connected to the land like that from small age, how we would not like allow these types of crazy, mindless cannibalistic projects to exist on this planet. 
And it's going to be interesting to see um, when you talk about relating, you know, caring for something. Um, so much has changed with the COVID um, pandemic, where suddenly people can see the sky. Um, the pollution has dropped down. I wonder if that's going to help sort of connect us to a sense of place and wanting to protect and keep something when it's suddenly cleaner. I hope so. But again, it comes down to the fact that like, yes, we're all, I also just want to say like, I also don't want to be like, oh, we're all related. So therefore, you know, all lives matter and support these narratives. Because like the reality is, is that we are all in the same, you know, on the same planet, but we haven't all been given the same advantages. And so we have to like think about and really question as like, like non-Indigenous, non-BIPOC uh, folks, like where is our privilege playing out in this moment? How do we deconstruct our own complicity in these, in these uh, perpetuation of these systems of extractivism, of capitalism, of patriarchy, to ensure that we are moving forward in a way that is uplifting and changing the dynamics and moving towards real equity. And not, again, not just equity for people, but equity for the planet. And I just, I really wanna name that because it can be really easy to fall into like, I feel really good, we're all related. The land is so beautiful. I'm gonna protect this little spot over here. But if we don't challenge the systemic root causes that have got us to this place, we're doing very little to actually disrupt and dismantle these systems. Mm -hmm. And I think we may have time for one more question. Somebody asked, um, what are some mitigation strategies that people who work in the theater could um, do or push forward? I think creating more spaces for um, BIPOC voices and stories to emerge um, I know there's been a lot of lot of work being done. I mean, even this is a testament to that. Um, but you know, we have a tendency in there has been a history within the art world to have a lot of like other people expressing those stories and just allowing us to tell our own stories and really trying to like again look at where our power, where our privilege, and how we can create the spaces to allow other people to come in. You know, when we talk about them in the Black Lives Matter movement right now, there's the defund the police. And it's like, where does those money, where does that money go to afterwards when we defund the police? Where do we talk, start talking about a redistribution of wealth? Because that wealth has been stolen, you know, for years. We need to start talking about reparations, reparations within all sectors of society that have benefited off of the stolen land and the stolen labor and the stolen lives of BIPOC folks. And it's not just black folks, it's not just indigenous folks. This, this, his, this country has a history of discrimination against Chinese, Japanese, Islamophobic. Like we have a history of deeply entrenched roots of racism and discrimination. And we need to start looking at how we, uh, like people, uh, not we, but how systems and people in positions of power and privilege can contribute to reparations, a redistribution of wealth, and creating an equal playing field and making space in that boat. So we're not all just out in the storm willy nilly. Thank you, Ariel. And if people want more information, they can go to your website, right? Yeah, you can check out uh, for more information on supporting indigenous climate solutions and strategies, um, including we're gonna be launching some resources and tools with indigenous climate action in the next couple of months or so. You can check us out at indigenousclimateaction.com. Um, and we often host webinars. We're doing some two-spirit webinars coming up for Pride Month. So check us out in the next couple of weeks. Thank you so much. Um, we are already halfway through our program for today. So we're going to take a five minute pause uh, because this is a long time sitting at a computer. So you can have a chance to stretch your legs, get a glass of water, use the bathroom. Um, please take this time to take care of your needs if uh, whatever you may need at this moment. Uh, you can also share, take this time to share your thoughts with other participants. You're welcome to talk among yourself in the Zoom room. Uh, you can also use the chat on the live stream. Uh, we'll have some music. We have some really great performances coming up afterwards. Um, so we hope you'll stay with us. And um, it is now 6.01 Eastern time. So we will be back in 10 minutes. Thank you.
Welcome back. Uh, for those of you just joining us, or for those of you who may not have seen me for a while, uh, I'm Sarah Garten Stanley, and I'm the uh, co curator for uh, the Green Rooms, along with uh, Chantal Bildeau. Um, it's been so wonderful to spend this first bit of the uh, afternoon, evening, or morning, depending on where you are, time together. Uh, thank you so much for uh, your time. Um, and the value of your time being spent with us. We really appreciate it in this grand experiment. And thank you so much for helping us build um, this conversation, uh, a conversation that we hope can continue to build um, over the coming days, weeks, months, and years ahead. Um, I am so looking forward to the second half. I'm gonna disappear again, probably until the end, but I just wanted to say hello. It's really great to be here. And now I'm gonna pass it over to Chantal. Bilodeau. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I am Chantal Bilodeau, a co-curator of this event with Sarah. And uh, welcome back to the Green Rooms. Now we're going to shift gear a little bit uh, because we've been talking, of course, um, we're talking about climate change theater, all the things that are in in intersecting. Um, but we also want to not just uh, talk about it, but bring some performance performance and performers into this gathering. So um, I am very pleased to introduce you to Erin Ball, who is uh, live from Kingston, Ontario. Erin is an extraordinary circus art artist with a unique story, and she was inspired to create a performance specifically for us in the, here in the green room. So here is Erin Ball. Matter Toronto. I hold a rope with both hands. My green dress is covered in vines. My mid-length red hair is in a side ponytail and my skin is white. I climb the rope slowly to leave my legs standing below. They are mannequin legs with plants and vines flowing out of them from the top. My own legs end just below the knees. Wrapped on the rope, I remove my skirt. I swing my body upside down, knee hooked. Lower wrap other leg. I tend to the plants below. I push the legs away. Climb. I hang upside down. Swing. Higher. Legs wrapped. I am upside down. I spin. Crescent moon shape. Upright. Arm wrapped. I hang by my elbow. I swing, spin. Split legs, bend and straighten. Scissor legs. Rope around shoulders. Upright, I gaze. 
Quick roll forward. I hang hands free. Unwrap. Scissor legs. Climb. Strong arm hold. Knees hooked. Turn to the side. Arms hold rope. Knees hooked. Horseshoe shape. I swing upside down. Split leg behind back. Little leg slides through small space. Upside down, I wrap my leg, a body weaved in front of rope. I pause. Drop to knees, upside down. I climb, scissor legs, swing, spin, upside down. Legs split. Quick sideways roll down. Near the bottom of the rope, I hang upside down. Gaze at legs. Unwrap. Descend and sit on ground. I gaze at the legs. Disclaimer, rope is physically demanding and unpredictable. The descriptions are pre-recorded and may not match the timing. I support defunding the police and Black Lives Matter. If you like this piece, please donate to Black Lives Matter Toronto. I hold a rope. It is suspended from the ceiling. I hold it with both hands. I wear a green dress that is covered in vines. Thank you, Erin, for this amazing performance. Really, really amazing performance. And um, I just want to point out that um, we've been talking, Ariel actually talked about um, patriarchy, and we have just an amazing, amazing group of powerful women today. Um, uh, yeah, I, as I see, because of course we haven't, none of us have experienced this whole thing um, in its entirety. We've just been talking to people separately and seeing and talking about things separately, but seeing it all in a row, I'm really pleased to be able to share um, those women with you. So next is a youth climate activist, Aidan Tomkinson, also from Kingston, who is one of the organizers of the Fridays for Future events in Kingston, in Ontario. Um, some of the loudest voices demanding change over the past have been the voices of young people who are worried about their future and for good reasons. Following in the footsteps of Swedish teen, teen activist Greta Thunberg, who founded the Fridays for Future movement, youth around the world are making their voices heard and urging politicians to act now. And one of those young voices belongs to Aidan Tomkinson, who is going to tell us a little bit about what she's been doing. Hi, everyone. My name is Aidan Tomkinson, and I am a youth activist and justice seeker. Now, some people's brains turn off when I say I'm a youth climate activist. I hear it all the time. 
those climate activists who strike on Fridays are just trying to get out of school by following a recent trend. I'm going to ask you right now, if you did turn your brain off, turn it back on because today I want to explain to you my perspective on being a youth climate activist. Today, I'm going to explain to you why I am involved in activism, how I got involved, and ways that you or people around you can get involved, and why it is ever so important that you do so. Ever since I was young, we have talked about how our Earth is suffering. I have fond memories when I was little and we'd be camping and it was ingrained into me to always respect the nature around me. I have been fortunate to be raised in an environment that values both the Earth and having respect for the things around me. As I have gotten older, I have seen more and more how this is not consistently the case for others. Sometimes I still find it shocking that others still do not understand the importance of respecting our Earth. Much of the disrespect is not their own fault, but stems from a lack of awareness, education, and submersion into a mindful environment. I felt the need to increase people's awareness around the growing climate crisis so as to avoid the shocking unawareness that can be seen now. I want to plant the seed for people to take it upon themselves to defeat their ignorance towards the problem and educate and be aware of the problems that humanity is facing. Mindfulness and respect is everything. If you have not felt angry, saddened, or fearful by the direction of our world is heading, you are not educated enough. People need to become motivated to act, which is what I want to help people feel. I felt the need for several reasons. I feel deeply for those who are struggling and will struggle the most through the consequences of humanity's actions and crimes against our earth. Our indigenous communities in Canada who are suffering without safe drinking water, oil spills infringing on their territories, and Canada believing that they have a right to their grounds. Homeless populations who will be unprotected from the rash environmental disasters. Young and old who will be more at risk. Young babies and infants being born onto the sick earth without a say, and so many more vulnerable populations that there are too many to list. My heart sinks with the thought of people and animals of all kinds suffering due to humanity's own unforgivable mistakes. And yes, I say unforgivable because humans have known for decades upon decades that there was a need to protect our earth. And yet, I still meet people who value themselves, money, and greed over our earth, should, who should be everyone's number one priority. Our earth, home, mother nature, permits us to live on this earth, and it is not the other way around. Without the earth, humanity is nothing. Overall, I think the need to act was due to my empathetic nature for feeling for those who are suffering, my frustration with people for their lack of education, and my want to educate those around me. I have always known that there was a problem with our world. It wasn't until recent years that everyone around me also did not realize the gravity of the problem that humans are faced with. I found, especially in my hometown of Kingston, people were shielded from the severity of the climate crisis. We are very safe from the impacts of the climate crisis where we live, and we should be very grateful for that. But because of this, people are ignorant towards the communities who are struggling in the world. So. In return, they have no motivation to act. I want to change this through educating people and making them mindful of issues that are ever so apparent in our world. Several years ago, I did this mostly through sharing important articles and news on my social media platforms and discussing important things with my friends and family. I was always actively educating myself so that I could educate the people around me. I soon realized that this was not enough. So I started striking from 10 to two in front of City Hall following the popular movement of Fridays for Future. Prior to COVID-19, myself and members of the community have been striking in Kingston for over a year. By doing so, I was able to make a stand for the fact that we care about the climate emergency. It allows us to have an open platform to educate people about the issues in the world and making personal connections with people. Speaking of connecting with people, through my activism, I have become involved in many groups such as 350 Kingston, Extinction Rebellion, and have participated in several other conferences and symposiums. In small steps, I became aware and able to develop connections and be able to talk to a bigger group of people like I am here today. I urge you to take the steps towards indulging in the necessary activism because we need everyone's skills. I have met some awesome people through the course of my activism. 
my fellow direct action activists, but also artists, healers, media workers, even politicians who are all fighting for a uniform cause. I am telling you this because I want to make it clear that you do not have to participate in huge rallies or put yourself way out there to act. Everyone is at their own comfort level within their activism, but that does not mean that we don't need your help. Through art, media, music, and maybe even methods that have yet to be invented, each one of us can become part of something bigger than ourselves. So today, I am not going to tell you to come out to the strikes or participate in any di civil disobedience, but I do want to tell you to act in any way that you can. Able your already present bodied skills. If you have been thinking of doing something, please do not let anyone or anything stop you. We are so fortunate to live in a world full of endless resources, voices, and organizations. In conclusion, I cannot wait to see the rise in activism over these next couple of years and see the amount of people using their voices to spread the messages that need to be spread. I would love to speak to you if you have any questions or need an idea on how to start activism initiatives within your community. Seriously, I would love to hear from you. Communication is so important, which we've learned now especially. You can reach me through the Fridays for Future Kingston Instagram page or Facebook page. And that's it. Thank you so, so much for listening. I really do hope to hear from some of you. Thank you so much, Hayden. Um, it's great to hear from you. Uh, I want to just come back for a second and say that you we heard a disclaimer after Aaron's um, performance earlier, and I should have mentioned that we were supposed to hear this, this disclaimer before her performance, but before because of technical difficulties, um, it was moved to the end. Um, now, uh, climate activism takes many forms, so, um, and we're going to hear a lot of, about that tomorrow. But for now, I would like to um, introduce you to Ariel Martz Oberlander, who is an artist and community organizer, who is going to talk about moving between professional theater and climate activist spaces. So welcome, Ariel. Thank you, Chantal, so much. Um, and thank you, Aiden. Wow. Uh, I just want to take a breath before I start my timer. Thank you to everyone who's spoken. Hmm. So um, my name is Ariel and um, I'm going to try and not talk too fast, but I couldn't cut down my notes anymore. So, um, and I can't see any of you yawning or getting bored, so I can do whatever I want. Um, my name is Ariel, as I said, Shalom Aleichem, Bruchim Habaim, if been a Yiddish Amadal from Am Yisrael, I'm currently coming to you from the occupied and stolen lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Uh, my grandparents came to Turtle Island uh, as refugees from Europe um, during a time when two full generations of my people were murdered in Europe and the Middle East. So my relationship to this land is complex. And if it weren't for the colonization of Canada, um, I don't know if I'd be alive. So I keep trying to work in a good way um, to live on this land in a, in a way that uh, honors that while acknowledging that I wasn't invited and I have a lot of work to do. I'm going to talk a little bit today about my work as a window into talking more about deconstructing the ideas of what we consider expert and professional. And I want to start by saying that I'm in no way an expert on anything I'm going to talk about, but I believe in the power of personal stories to open up the places where our experiences intersect. And I also want to offer the idea that we don't need to have shared experiences in order to fight for each other. And that I can accept that I don't understand what it's like to be you, but I can still be your accomplice. So I'm really still an emerging artist in most, way, most ways. I'm, I'm pretty young, thank goodness. But I hope that every room that I go into, I can help question ideas of what is a professional, who gets to talk, who gets to interrupt, and who is a real artist. I trained as an actor first, but at the same time, I was always kind of doing parallel work as a climate justice organizer. And even though I was in theater school, getting cast and things, I never really felt able to call myself an artist. I wasn't convinced that I had this thing that they talk about called talent. And I definitely didn't feel pretty enough to be in film and TV, but I was starting to do this work in community organizing that I felt was really meaningful. And I was learning how to listen deeply and act out of a place of justice. Uh, at first, I just went to meetings and I listened for months, and then I started to take on tasks and I felt useful. 
And then I was elected president of a campaign on campus. And most importantly, I was learning that what I had been taught about environmentalism actually needed to be a much deeper struggle for decolonization, anti-racism, and re-indigenization of the system. And after I graduated theater school, I wasn't sure I was a real artist at all. So I took six months off from the arts and I spent time at Unistoten camp during that fall. And Unistoten is a frontline settlement that it's about 10 years old now. You've probably heard of it uh, this year when the military went to invade the settlement to start building one of the many pipelines that um, is slated to go through that area. But this was some years before that. Um, and I wanna talk about an elder that I met there at Unistoten camp. Um, there was an elder there named Brian Granbois, and he was one of these really cool older gentlemen who was a lifelong warrior. He'd been at so many of the major struggles like Oka Crisis, Gustafson Lake, Elsa Pogtog, and he wore only camo, only camo always. And he used to ask me to ride in his car into town with him because if he had a young white woman with him, the cops were less likely to stop him. And that made me feel so special. Brian escaped going to residential schools as a kid because his parents, his grandparents hid him in the forest when the Indian agents came to take the children away. So he grew up with his culture and his language in the bush. And I was like hiding children in the forest. Well, as a Jew, I have those stories in my families too. And the most beautiful thing that Brian told me was that in his language, Dene, Ariel, which is my name, um, is a word and it means thunder. And I think that's also Ariel Derangé's, uh, the meaning of her name too. So I feel a special connection. In my language, it means Lion of God. And I thought that was the most beautiful thing that a word can exist in two languages from completely different places. Uh, and I hold that with me always. I feel really blessed by that gift. Um, and Brian passed on last year. Since then, I've lived at or visited about five frontline camps, including helping to start a camp on the steps of BC Hydro headquarters where we lived for three months to protest the Site C Dam and the flooding of the Peace River Valley in Treaty 8. Um, and I was also a Know Your Rights trainer at the Watch House camp led by the Tsleil-Waututh Nation and Burnaby Mountain in 2018. But I wanna be careful about how I talk about these front lines because I don't wanna speak for them. And I really encourage you to look them up and learn directly from the people who have started them and who are living there. Since then, I have done a show in a bog, a performative flooding of Christy Clark's lawn, which was quickly surrounded by undercover RCMP, but it made the news. So that was a success. Shows at fringe festivals in parks, in more traditional festivals and theaters, a show on a yacht, a touring show for one audience member at a time, which is a conversation about climate grief, which has taken place under a tree, at a conference and other places, and many, many other shows that I don't have time to talk about. I'm running out of time, but I will share, I'm gonna share my email in the chat, especially for any young people who wanna talk about what my career has looked like or what might be possible, uh, because it's all possible and you're already an artist. Um, and what I can do more and more is to marry my organizing work with my theater work, um, which I didn't think would be possible. And the work I make is very rooted in community well-being, audience care, trauma-informed processes, decolonization, uplifting youth voices, decentralizing access, etc. For the past three years, I have run the youth program at the Colch in Vancouver, where I get to raise up young voices and give away resources to people who don't usually get them. And more than that, I get to help youth that I work with run their own programming and see themselves as artists and as agents within their own communities in new ways. When it comes to down to it, what we don't need is more allies, we need accomplices. And to me, that means wherever I have privilege, I give it away. Wherever I have power or resources, I give it away. And I try to hold every door open behind me. Climate change, we know, doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's only possible because of systemic dis disenfranchisement and theft from Indigenous, Black, and disabled and queer bodies. So to me, every movement towards justice is also climate justice. And uh, that's what I hope to do through my work as an artist and a community organizer. Thanks.
Thank you, Ariel. Thank you for making yourself um, so available. I'm sure some people will be happy to reach out to you. And um, I want to tell you that looking at you on the screen, you are definitely pretty enough to be on, on in cinema, on film. <laughs> um, so next, uh, music can also be a form of activism. So the Toronto-based group Lau, uh, which is known for making electronic music uh, that puts community first, is going to be next. Bruce Zina Kazi and Nicholas Murray have been holding down Canada's underground DIY music scene for decades. They started performing separately in hip hop and spoken word and then came together as music and life partners. Lal works tirelessly to make the future that they envision a reality in the here and now. Here they are.
all my black folks, my indigenous folks, my queer folks, my trans folks, my two-spirit folks, to those of us who have been held down, to those of us who are rising up, and this is the time, despite, despite this COVID shit. We've been struggling way before that. This goes out to you, this goes out to my father, Hawk. Thank you, Lal, Rose, and Nick. Thank you for this wonderful performance. Um, at the beginning of the opening picnic today, which is this event, before we went live on the live stream, uh, composer, sound artist, and musicologist Matt Rogalski, who is here with us working in the background so you can't see him, uh, recorded the participant in our eight cities saying hello in their own city-specific way. And then over the last two and a half hours, Matt has been editing these sound files to compose the piece that you're about to hear, which is titled Hello Remix. Thank you. 
Thank you, Matt. I hope uh, you enjoyed, everybody enjoyed this. We're almost at the end of our time together uh, for today because we're going to be here again tomorrow and Friday. But before we wrap up, we have one more offering. Um, the last two months have been challenging in so many ways, but it's been truly amazing to watch how an overwhelming number of us have risen to the occasion often putting the well-being being in safety of others above our own. And I have to say that in a world where there's so many reasons to despair, I find hope uh, in this. I find hope in seeing that we can actually be there for each other. Tomorrow, we have a series of presentation and conversations scheduled where we'll have the opportunity to talk with several guests. But for now, we wanna offer you a chance to breathe. So please sit comfortably, close your eyes if you'd like, take a deep breath. The next 10 minutes are for you. Enjoy One Breath, Many Bells by sound artist Debashish Sinha.
Well, beautiful. Thank you. I stretched at least three times through that. Beautiful music, beautiful work, everyone. Thank you for a fantastic um, time together. Uh, that's it for today. I want to thank everyone in all eight of the portals, everyone who managed to make their way through the registration um, so that we could record um, uh, all of the all of the things. Um, I am feeding back a little bit right at the end of the day. Um, I just want to say thank you to Derek Chan, Murdoch Sean, Frank Donato, Tracy Guptill, Angelica Schwartz, Stuart Legere, Charles Douglas, and Molly Braverman. Amazing facilitators who have been in the rooms with all of you um, making this, um, I hope, an experiment and collecting and then gathering into the larger groups. Uh, we hope you'll join us tomorrow uh, between 3 and 7 Eastern Standard Time uh, for a series of conversations. And again, tomorrow evening between 9 and 11 for another conversation. Uh, and um, Cyrus Marcus Ware, he's going to be back to DJ the... Uh, it's going to be awesome. Um, uh, the schedule and all the links are available on the NAC website or at Folda. Um, and there's a whole uh, slew of programming happening tonight. It's been amazing spending this time with you. I want to pass it over to Chantal for one more moment just to say, Chantal, you were an incredible host. And uh, it's been a pleasure making this work with you tonight. Thank you to everybody. Chantal, a few words. Yeah, well, thank you, Sarah, for inviting me on this project and letting me be a part of it. Um, thank you to everybody who joined us. I'm very pleased to um, spend this time with you to um, uh, I'm based in New York. New York oh, started to reopen on Monday. So it's like, oh, maybe now we can get a little closer to each other. And um, this is a way to start this getting closer to each other. So I hope you will be with us tomorrow and on Friday. We have some exciting uh, people coming to talk with us and um, we hope you'll be there. And one last thing to say, this is co-created together. So um, this is part of the work. Uh, we're going to keep working together. And on uh, the last day on Friday, we hope to make a special piece with all of you and all the new people who come and join us. So thanks again. And we will see you tomorrow. See you soon.